Oil is at 105 bucks a barrel. Russia is basically trying to break the back of Europe by now messing with their nat gas supplies. Um, the German energy minister yesterday said that if that happens, it could be a contagion equivalent to Lehman Brothers with respect to energy. You're already starting to see food riots, food insecurity, energy insecurity, rampant inflation, uh, sovereign defaults. And you have to ask yourself, like, how are we going to really tourniquet this whole thing and prevent a much bigger contagion like Freeberg just talked about? If Russia decides to play hardball against Europe or America, we better hope that it's a mild winter because very quickly you can go from plus one million barrels to minus two in a, in a heartbeat. Hello and welcome to Money Talks. In today's video, venture capitalist, entrepreneur, and CEO of Social Capital, Shamath Polyapedia, updates about the ongoing energy crisis in Europe and its impact on the global economy. Shamath also speaks about the potential fracturing of the Western alliance, how we got here, endgame, and more. The Middle East plus um, United States, the best job possible to basically get the maximum demand so that there's as much energy as possible. The reasons that Europe are in an energy crisis really should be discussed honestly. So, number one, an entire continent essentially allowed a 16-year-old girl to dictate their energy policy. And when Greta Thunberg was able to shame an entire continent into basically walking away from nuclear and not really evaluating how you can actually have energy independence. What they did was they put Europe in an incredibly fragile position. And at the beginning of this war, it wasn't clear how much damage the lack of Russian energy would do to the European economy. But now it's absolutely clear. Outraged Western leaders are threatening a price cap on imports of Russian natural gas after Moscow cut supplies to Europe this month, deepening an already dire energy and cost of living crisis. In response, Russian President Vladimir Putin has warned that Europe will freeze this winter unless there is a change of tack. In this back and forth, the West keeps stepping up the rhetoric. Putin is accused of using a mix of blackmail and economic terror against Europe. His actions supposedly prove once more that he is a monster who cannot be negotiated with and a threat to world peace. Denying fuel to Europe as winter approaches in a bid to weaken the resolve of European states to support Kyiv and alienate European publics from their leaders is Putin's opening gambit in a plot to expand his territorial ambitions from Ukraine to the rest of Europe. Or so runs the all-too-familiar narrative shared by Western politicians and media. In fact, Europe's arrogant, self-righteous posturing over Russian gas supplies, divorced from many discernible geopolitical reality, reflects precisely the same foolhardy mindset that helped provoke Moscow's invasion of Ukraine in the first place. It is also the reason why there has been no exit ramp, a path to negotiations, even as Russia has taken vast swaths of Ukraine's eastern and southern flanks, territory that cannot be reclaimed without a further massive loss of life on both sides as the limited Ukrainian assault around Kharkiv has highlighted. The real lesson is that in all of our haste to basically overtly judge Trump because of his delivery and his, you know, his personal style or whatever, we ran towards a 16-year-old person who has no rooting in science or technology to dictate the energy policy of an entire continent. I mean, the, she was nominated for a Nobel Prize just to remind you guys, this is how insane all of these people were. So in an effort to virtue signal to the hilt and beyond, what we essentially did, what the entire world did, was turn a blind eye to science and turn a blind eye to mathematics and simple understanding of supply and demand. And so now you have this situation where the entire continent of Europe is probably on the precipice of and the minimum of a recession. But frankly, there's a lot of scenarios where it could be meaningfully worse. And I think what it does is ultimately it has forced the Russian endgame. And that Russian endgame is essentially the following, which is that Germany will probably be the first 
to capitulate. But it'll be a combination of the United States and Europe who negotiate some kind of a settlement. They have to fold. And and the reason, well, without calling it folding, I would just say there's a settlement. And the reason the settlement is necessary is you're going to start to impact tens of millions of people's lives in an incredibly arduous way. And those people are asking their leaders to tell them why it's worth it. That's why you're seeing protests all around Europe. People have decided that this war has gotten two or three steps beyond what they thought they were getting into, and that it was shining light on a whole set of decisions that never should have been made. The media could start by dropping their indignation at insolent Moscow for refusing to supply Europe with gas. After all, Moscow has been only too clear about the reason for the shutdown of gas supplies. It is in retaliation for the West imposing economic sanctions, a form of collective punishment on the wider Russian population that risks violating the laws of war. The West is well-practiced in waging economic war on weak states, usually in a futile attempt to topple leaders they don't like or as a softening up exercise before it sends in troops or proxies. I think that the European system is going to be put under stress because there are really a bunch of different countries with very different incentives right now, um, where some countries are in desperate need of energy, some countries can probably stave it off for a little bit longer. Other countries are so adamantly focused on their position on Russia over and above uh, any source of energy that they may need or don't have. So I just think like this is a really good point to take a step back and realize that in all of these conflicts, Sadly, whenever you have like all of these very complicated countries fighting very complicated wars, it's really important to understand what these trade-offs are, because ultimately what we're learning in Europe is that irrespective of what you morally and ethically believe is right in the Ukraine, the minute that it affects you, and Jason, you've said this, what is it, like you're only one meal away from a revolution? Is that, yeah, it's is, three is meals away, yeah. But, that, but that's the lesson, which is that at the end of the day, it is when you're in a position of comfort. You can focus on forward and outlooking moral um, attributes and ethical perspectives that matter. But the minute that you are affected at home, where you cannot take care of your children or heat your house, all bets are off. And I think this just goes to show you that if you're going to sort of engage in proactive foreign policy, you need to make sure that domestically, you don't have any Achilles heels. And Europe had a massive Achilles heel, which is energy. So what do you think about Europe's energy crisis? Tell us in the comments. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe. See you soon with the next video. Thank you so much for watching.